Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Quickly, if you're new to the channel, please hit like, please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell so you're alerted whenever we go live, because sometimes we may do things like we're doing today, where I did not want to sacrifice the liveness of the show because our guest had a hard out earlier than we usually end. So I said, hey, let's just start the show a little earlier check it to see who's actually hitting the notification bell as always thank you to all the subscribers on youtube and twitch and all the audio only podcast formats you find us on also thanks to our patrons collectively you are the fuel and the engine that keeps tir moving along if you're enjoying what we do and want access to our post show champagne room which we'll be going to today most likely just Toussaint and i our guest again hasn't hard out and I don't know if we can subject our guests to the champagne room. <laughs> the backstage conversation was enough. What we have in store for the champagne room may be cancellation territory. But for as little as $30 for the entire year, you can make sure you have not only access to the champagne room, be part of the live virtual audience for the Mau Mau Hour. Join us for movie nights, but you can make sure that we stay on the air. And do things like this. Have celebrity special guests. Please welcome, coming all the way live from Philadelphia, the man, the myth, the legend, the author, the organizer, Paul Prescott. Yeah, what, what an intro. Your, your check is in the mail. That was. <laughs> I'm, I'm, look, when I got this email um, from, the, from the PR company, you were the first name that popped into my mind. Thank you. I'm a. Uh... I'm a Rustin head. Is that a thing? But uh, um, you, you, you have s some good Rustin takes. Uh, Adolf came to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was like, no, let's get Paul. Paul's re actually both of you written about it somewhat recently. Um, also, she is the faceless voice of reason. She keeps us sane. She is the M2 song. Hello, hello. Shout out to the notification gang. We out here Real early. <laughs> Real ones. They think it's early because technically it's early, but we still started five minutes late. Because they said 545. And mm. that's in my bad. Um, so I'm gonna just gonna get right into it because Paul came up with some great questions. And I also want to preface this whole show by saying. This is not about the Netflix Obama's Rustin movie. I canceled my Netflix right when that thing came out. Like the the, the Rustin movie came out. The uh, uh, the Kindy's got a thing coming out. So all of the chocolate wokeness that's part of the racial reckoning of 2020. I'm I'm cutting I'm cutting my access off from that. No more Omarion movies. <laughs> Just, I'm done with it all. So, I hope that our guest is Googling Omarion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was gay, black, queer, Quaker, pacifist, socialist. He was also one of the architects of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He was a staunch critic on black power in a moment when the civil rights movement was beginning to integrate itself into the Democratic Party race management. The man I'm speaking of, and the one we'll be discussing today, is Bayard Rustin, a controversial figure to some because he's viewed as too harsh of a critic on the upstart black power movement in the mid 60s. And some people just simply see him as a state informant. But that is not the full picture of the man. Today, we'll get to speak with filmmaker Nancy Cates, who was responsible for the 2003 documentary, Another Outsider, a very good movie. Before you even think about watching that Netflix thing, please watch. If you haven't seen Brother Outsider, please watch it. 
But her response, her documentary uh, attempts to present the viewer with a three-dimensional portrayal of Rustin from the people that knew him, family, and lovers. Our guest today is award-winning filmmaker based out of my home in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please welcome Nancy Keats. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Are we allowed to talk about Toussaint Louverture because of Madame M. Toussaint? I saw the little, in your intro, I, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's off topic. Um, the, the, the main co-host uh, on the show who's, who's ill right now uh, has a very complicated view of Toussaint Louverture and is more of a Dessalinian and um, for fear of the Haitian community yelling at me. Okay, I'm sorry. I withdraw the whole thing. I just <laughs> it was a very interesting intro, you know, with Che and Toussaint. And I was sort of trying to test myself on how many of these people do I know and what do I think about them and you where do they a, a where TIR. do they go in the timeline? And you know, anyway, I'll be quiet now. Stepped into a TIR <laughs> quagmire. With oh yeah, you, you you don't understand. You don't understand. Like I, the last thing I want to do is have this this gentleman who is not feeling very well right now call me up and just. I hate to start and then hang up the phone. I'm so sorry. Okay. I just That's okay. No, I'm, topic, teasing. You know? I'm teasing. Tucson is related to Tucson. I I have a friend. Who, I am. I'm sorry. I, I have a friend who runs Louverture Films mm-hmm. named after him. That's all. I'm done. Oh, no, no, no. We're, 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 look, we all don't share the exact same politics. It's just, you know, this internet world is full of gossip. <laughs> <laughs> the game of tel- Tucson. Can you imagine the game of telephone that would get back to Pascal and Paul McComb? <laughs> Paul, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first, let me say I, you know, I, I first watched this documentary, I think in like 2018, 2019. And then last night I rewatched it in preparation for the show. And it was such, it was very refreshing after watching the. Obama produced Netflix movie. We'll get to that later. Uh, but I really enjoyed watching it again. And I guess my first question is kind of just about Byard in general. And I think this moment where I guess he's kind of having a moment where people are kind of rediscovering or looking into him more. And I think he's an interesting figure because on the one hand, he's almost like cartoonishly intersectional in terms of his identity. But his politics were kind of like a Bernie Sanders style class focused social democracy. And I think as people are now celebrating him, probably a lot of those same people don't actually share his politics or really know what his politics were about. I have a feeling if we were to put up some quotes from Biden Rustin and not say who's, who said these quotes, people would kind of react badly to them and say, you know, maybe they're offensive or they're class reductionist. So I guess, what do you make of this like current revival of interest and by Rustin, um, you know, why is it happening now? I mean, how do you see this playing out? That's kind of a hard question. I think it's long overdue, obviously. Um, we tried not to get into the niceties of the splits in the socialist left in the 70s, like the Democratic Socialists of America split with some other people. And, you know, you have to have an advanced degree in lefty politics to get through all this. So we just kind of didn't put that in our film. But Rustin changed over time. And I think people don't understand that. And as I've gotten older, I think I understand it more. For example, because he he had been a lifelong pacifist, but because he was connected to the Democratic Party, he did not speak out against the Vietnam War. And all of his younger colleagues were furious with him. And when we were making the film, I was not happy with him. I thought, what the hell? Why don't you speak out against Vietnam? But he wanted the support of the Democratic Party for civil rights and labor stuff and other things. So um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, when a big studio makes a feature film, it creates a lot of interest in someone. I don't know why it's taken so many years since his death in 1987 for this to happen. Um, but I am also kind of proud that we finished our film 20 years ago. And, you know, even if they didn't, you know, they didn't actually ask me to help them, but they clearly leaned on our film. And so I get to say, oh, I had this idea a long time ago to, to you know, tell this important story of a overlooked American. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but thank you. Oh yeah, I I, 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 I noticed that too. To it help more. <laughs> I, One at a time, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we had another documentary filmmaker on here that made a great movie about um, guardianship that was turned into a Netflix movie as well called We Care a Lot. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's a similar situation because I think he was in the talks with Netflix and some things went sideways and it's the film industry, as you know, it's not the most honest of industries. Um, but that being said, uh, in your portrayal of Rustin, you didn't really get too much into the whole informant thing that uh, kind of has haunted his legacy, especially, I think, and I don't know if Paul and Tucson agree with this, but I think because he was such a, a critic of the Black Power moment um, that a lot of people love leaning into that uh, he was an FBI informant to kind of... Uh, kill his legacy of, of anything important um, i mean he was accused of also being connected to the cia because of freedom house which is an organization that he joined later in life that does election monitoring and other things i mean we didn't find clear evidence of these things we we found kind of rumors so i i don't know if i'm sounding too conservative for your um podcast but you know we tried not to we were pretty serious about not spreading rumors in a certain way or trading in rumors. So for example, we didn't want anyone who hadn't actually slept with him to talk about his sex life, which was a little common mm. because a lot of his encounters were not that formal. Um, but I thought that was smart, you know, that it wouldn't be gossip. It would be, I actually was the boyfriend of Bayard Rustin. Mm -hmm. So because we didn't have, you know, we certainly heard rumors about this, but we didn't, we did not encounter a lot of concrete evidence of this. That's why it's not in our film. Mm. Uh, but, you know, certainly even if he wasn't an FBI informant, he was also spied on by the FBI, but, but he clearly became a much more establishment figure as he got older and, you know, and was interested in, you know, making alliances with Jewish groups. And, you know, there's a photograph of him with Golda Meir and also with Ellie Giselle. And, you know, there are a lot of things that he did because he had principles about maintaining loyalties that, as time went on, we're not that popular. Mm -hmm. Paul, did you want to add something to that? We, I had a kind of another question just kind of related to this. I mean, kind of speaking to this moment where he's changing and evolving, you know, I think a seminal work of his is from Protest of Politics, which is, you know, covered in the documentary. And personally, I kind of feel like this essay has always been a little misunderstood. And I think the simplistic version is him just saying, let's stop protesting, we just need to vote, go full Democratic Party. And even sometimes in Rustin's interviews, I feel like he kind of simplifies what is actually in the essay. And like when I read the essay, I kind of see a much heavier component that's talking about really quite radical structural economic changes that would have to come through the political system. But I kind of don't see it as this very simple, like just become a standard Democrat. He was kind of talking about I think some very radical things in that essay, but what is your kind of interpretation of from protests to politics in his life? Well, I have to admit, I haven't read it recently. So that's an interesting <laughs> thing because I should have studied for my quiz here today. But sorry, I, sorry. I, no, 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 it's good. This is really good. It's I, I love the depth. I, I appreciate rigor in my life. So I actually need to thank you for the question. I think there are things such as, you know, he proposed this freedom budget for all Americans, which was supposed to take the money that we were wasting in Vietnam and actually apply it to poverty and jobs creation and all sorts of things that would help, particularly African Americans, but other people as well, poor people. And, you know, that didn't go anywhere. There's a recent film about the freedom budget. I don't know how you make a film about a huge document that's, you know, that doesn't move, but I, you know, somebody made a film about it. And there is uh, footage of Rustin testifying on this at, in Congress where you could smoke cigarettes at that time. So it's hilarious footage. Um, but certainly, you know, I think his point was that before the Voting Rights Act um, and the Civil Rights Act, it was hard for large swaths of, you know, African-Americans in America to vote. So of course, marching was kind of the only thing you could do. But, you know, once, I mean, obviously there's still terrible problems with, you know, people trying to squash voting rights. But, you know, once those pieces of legislation had come in, it was possible for African-Americans in particular to be a greater block of, in, of sort of influence in the Democratic Party. So it wasn't, I think it wasn't simplistic of just go vote, but it was actually like, 
okay, if we are now part of the political system in a way that we have not been allowed to be in the past, what do we want to accomplish? I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I agree with you that it's more sophisticated than people have thought. But I also think that there is a reflection of his own life in that essay. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, that, that, and lots and lots of people, maybe present company excluded, become less radical as they age. I think it's, it often happens and I find people find it frustrating. Um, Do you believe that it was his access and you, you kind of touch on this? in the documentary, in some of the interviews, do you think it had something to do with a certain amount of access to power? And, you know, after the March on Washington, he's kind of revered as a guy that can get things done. He can talk to the president on the phone. I think someone says in the documentary that he's riding around in the vice president's limo. Is there something, do you agree with this too, Paul, that when, when you get to a certain level, um, that amount of power becomes intoxicating? I think it's another way to look at it, that if you've worked for 39 years mm. uh, to achieve civil rights, which if you start, he started at the age of 15, you know, protesting in his hometown. I, I did the math once and, and um, I think the Voting Rights Act was put in place 39 years after he started being an activist. So yeah. Power is probably intoxicating. I've never ridden in the vice president's limousine, so how would I know? <laughs> but, I mean, sorry. But, but you know, but I also think, so we interviewed a lot of these ancient um, peace activists, and I totally admired them. They're all gone now. Um, and a lot of, some of them died right after the film was completed. Mm. Um, they had been working for something that they were never going to achieve for their entire adult lives. And they were very, very dedicated. They would go and march and protest and write letters and all this stuff. I think that Bayard Russell wanted to actually get, get make some stuff happen. You know, like the March on Washington was an event that that took place that he organized that happened, right? Unfortunately, peace is obviously very important, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, is it the access to power, or is it the sense of getting some 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 stuff done that he wanted? I I don't know. I can't speak for him, but mm -hmm. I think it's worth thinking about that. That you know, that it was actually possible to achieve more by working in the labor movement and by working in civil rights than it was in the peace movement. I think another thing that might, I think it's helpful context. I think it's easy from our standpoint now to look back and be like, how could you ever think you could do something in the Johnson administration? You know, and all we're thinking about is the Vietnam War, but I think it's worth remembering that I mean, at the time, the early years, a lot of civil rights leaders were really surprised at how progressive Johnson yeah. was. And unlike Kennedy, was actually able to get these bills passed and was really kind of skillfully, I mean, co-opting in a sense, but really showing like, I'm actually going to work for these things and I'm delivering. So, you know, it's not, I don't, I kind of feel like if I was in that moment, it, it wouldn't be insane to think in those early years, like we actually can get some mileage here um and i think you know something that's also overlooked by people is like he was still i think pressing the administration a lot i mean i think when it came to poverty russian was very critical of the war on poverty and that approach he was very critical of uh moynihan and this idea of like well it's the problem with the black family mm -hmm. um but i think you know it's kind of easy now to be like well lbj of course was horrible you know but i think there was the domestic side that they were seeing kind of this window, this opportunity that they felt maybe we should, we should go with it. Wait, I have to interrupt and ask, like, you really are a rusted head. Like how, how do you know? <laughs> are you allowed to ask you questions or is it only the other way around? No, only <laughs> oh, ask Paul. That would be the most awesome thing ever. If you ask Paul a question, well, I it's just, I'm really impressed by how much, you know, and this policy stuff and you know, Oh, Nancy, but, I mean, I think another thing too that's interesting is like maybe, yes, in a sense, less radical in terms of the access. But one thing that kind of always frustrates me is if you look at the freedom budget proposal, I mean, that's essentially social democracy or democratic socialism in this country. I mean, it's like the burning platform, but maybe even more ambitious. And you compare that to the platforms being put forward by certain black power groups at the exact same time. I think it's actually pretty clear what was more radical, it, which was the freedom budget in terms of a redistrib redistribution of, you know, wealth and resources. 
Um, but it's just kind of interesting how he kind of is now looked at as the more moderate figure. I think on a previous episode, I talking with Jason, we were saying, I think some of it is just style. You know, he's wearing a suit. He has this weird British access accent. It doesn't seem militant or radical. Same thing with A. Philip Randolph. They don't seem radical, but I think the content of what they were pushing for was actually quite radical. He, he also doesn't come through in the Jim Crow South. So I, I feel like, and I think Nancy's documentary does do this justice, that his view of the world from, like you say, he starts at 15 years old. Because he doesn't come from the Jim Crow South, I think his view of the world is a little more accepting of ideas like socialism and communism. Um, but he was it, a member of the Young Communist Party, which he then rejected because of Stalin. But, yeah. um, but you know, there, there was a lot of posturing. I, I feel like I'm not the person who should be speaking about the Black Power <laughs> movement, but there was a lot of posturing about women, about gay people. You know, I think there was a, I don't know, I don't, I'm not really a gender studies person, but there was a bit of a crisis of masculinity within the Black Power movement. So, you know, when Mary Baraka was attacking him for being a fag, you know, it's, it's posturing, right? It's like street theater, but it, it makes Rustin look kind of, you know, weak, I guess. I mean, again, you could say, well, why was he being so homophobic? Like, I don't, you know, nowadays I tried to, we tried to interview him and he would not respond to me because I imagined he was embarrassed by the time we were making the film, you know, oh. circa 2000, 2001, that, you know, that he had said these things. Um, but I, you know, maybe it's for the two of you to talk about why it was such an intense need to, you know, to project a sort of, I don't know, virility. If the, I don't, I don't know if this is the right. Nancy, word. how dare you live in Berkeley and <laughs> not say you're a gender studies person? Come on, <laughs> what is that? Do you really? Live tell you, yeah, where do you? Do you live in South well, Berkeley. I kind of am, that? but I'm a filmmaker. I, you know, I don't teach anywhere. You, you are nowhere near Solano Avenue, are you? <laughs> I, I am. It's about, um, I don't know, less than a mile from here. Yeah. And you don't. So you're going to tell me that you go to Zachary's and you're not a gender studies expert. I can't eat pizza, but I think this is, we're getting really off the subject. <laughs> I, I was trying to talk about, you know, African-American masculinity in relation to the black power movement, which is much more mm -hmm. serious than Zachary's, but. So you say. <laughs> so you say. Okay, you won that round. Jason. I, I can see. I can see. <laughs> but seriously, can we talk mm -hmm. about this? Sure. Toussaint. You've been quiet. I have been quiet. You don't want to get canceled for saying the wrong thing? <laughs> I don't. I mean, I, I, from what I've gleaned over the years, there was an idea of Malcolm X being, well, I know it was Ozzie Davis who said that Malcolm X is our, our masculinity, our manhood. Mm -hmm. so th it, there was something very important in these civil rights leaders being masculine enough to to lead other black men it was a requirement I, I think we have to start you know kind of looking at this stuff realistically and say at a certain point a lot of things happened and everybody gets thrown into the same basket with the with the, mm -hmm. the privilege of hindsight everybody gets thrown into the um race management basket right and a lot of people did get sucked into the democratic party Right. The civil rights movement mm -hmm. kind of does fall apart at the end. But when we when we think about civil rights leaders that were actually, you know, fighting for policy and people that were commentators, that also gets thrown into the same basket. And that's mm -hmm. very different. Nancy, I don't have to make any sort of political alignments so I can call everybody an asshole. I can call everybody a sellout. Nobody's <laughs> as real as me. No one's going to be as hardcore as me, mm -hmm. right? And all day long, I can do that. It's different when you have to make those political alignments. And I think that's one of the thing that, things that people like Rustin and King, to a certain extent, fight with. Because he says, when you're protesting, you don't give in. You don't have to, you know, ha have that kind of back and forth negotiation so you don't have to compromise you don't have to comp thank you you don't have to compromise that's the word i'm looking for thank you tucson again voice sure. is 
Um, but, but, but the thing is, we get so hung up on the rhetorical nature of some of the things. You have a clip where you have the late Amiri Baraka talking. And it's just words that sound radical. And a lot of that stuff was just today, 2023. If we wanted to get more views, we would just say words. White supremacy. How dare you, white woman? Come on. The, right? That's just, it's just words. We can go now. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, I don't think I should be speaking about the Black Power Movement for that very reason. That's why I was, you know, I was kind of like. I mean, you're asking a question. You're not condemning it, right? And I think also this. Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. No, I I think it's just an interesting because there were also parts of the Black Power Movement that were actually, you know, feminist and pro-gay. You know, it's not it's not a monolith. Um, But, you know, I guess I'm not a gender studies person, but as a lesbian, I get to say certain things about gender anyway. Without, you know, without portfolio. <laughs> That's my word. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lesbian thing. You wouldn't understand. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Um, right. But I think, I think, okay, let me just say this. When mm-hmm. we were making the film, I started to feel a little protective of Bayard because by then he had been a young, you know, radical and he had really done some crazy stuff and gotten arrested and gone to jail as a conscientious objector. And then he was older and this new generation of radicals came up and they maybe were considered more radical than the previous radicals. And so they looked at him as like, you know, a sort of conservative older person relative to them, right? I mean, Kwame Torre, Stokely Carmichael, he, he revered him. But then you see him, you know, kind of turning on Rustin and, and saying, you know, you're not radical enough, you're not committed enough. And I, I think there's these, there are these generational tensions. And, you know, we put the um, debates in our film because we wanted to give voice to the people who didn't agree with Rustin. And, you know, I, I hope I get to say this, I don't know, as, as a, you know, white person who cares a lot about racial justice, I'm proud that that Kwame Torre says in our film that America is racist from top to bottom and from left to right, because unfortunately, I think it's true, you know, but I'm not going to say it. He says but, it. But again, but again, and this isn't, an, again, a huge knock on Kwame Torre because we've played videos of him before. And I think there's a lot to gain from the things he said. That being said, what does he do in the 60s and 70s and the 80s? He speaks at colleges. And, you know, Rustin has a. Well, I, I think it's a great quote. Yeah. I, I believe it's an article or an interview maybe from the early 70s where he's kind of reflecting on Black power, um, Black national, where it's gotten us. And he kind of says, well, where are they now? I mean, Kwame Ture charges 2500 a speech on mostly white college campuses, Eldridge Cleavers in Algeria. You know, it's like, where is this all, this energy gone to? And I think um, he was kind of critical. It was almost like a, a flightiness of like these things came and it was a flash in the pan and then where where has it left us um well i think he felt that separatism was not sustainable it wasn't that he didn't respect the the idea of it and going back to africa was sustainable for individuals but not for millions and millions of african americans um so i think that's that's part of it too i mean i'm thinking of my friend Kevin Gaines, who was one of the advisors to the film, um, who wrote a book about African Americans returning to Africa, I believe I should look it up before I start talking about it in public. But you know, there were a bunch of people who did leave America um, with varying results, I think. And and Kwame Torre himself came back, you know, because he needed health care. That you know. Anyway, we're getting off the subject. I. I- I don't think so. I think it's kind of in line with with the main question that you asked, because, again, this stuff is always viewed in a way where the civil rights movement is your grandparents and your parents thing. They were nice about it. And the civil rights movement forever is the end of Martin Luther King's speech, which for all intents and purposes, it's pretty tame speech for a lot of the speeches that he had before and especially after. Right, because he knows he's giving it in front of two hundred thousand people. Two hundred fifty, but who's counting? Yeah, but who's counting? <laughs> you, know, and he, you know, he wanted um, the poor people's campaign, which you know people like Andrew Young and Russell were a little nervous about because they felt like it was diluting King's message. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think we've been criticized, but not very often, by you know somebody accused me once 
when I was speaking in public of diminishing Dr. King by putting Rustin forward. And I said, you know, actually the civil rights movement was a lot of people, Mm -hmm. you know, we all think of it as just one person and he was incredibly important, but you know, person. And, and I, and I think it's sort of sad. I think one thing that I feel maybe we contributed a little bit to by making our film is to say, there's a lot more complexity to this history than what the average person is exposed to in school. Um, Mm. I mean, you two are like, you know everything. I still want to know, Paul, how you got <laughs> the knowledge of Rustin or, you know, where you've studied all this. It's very impressive. It's just being a nerd, you know, that's, that's all <laughs> but there was a funny quote. Again, I wish, um, I don't know exactly when he said it, but he basically said, you know, I think Rustin had a good, as a good organizer would, a good appreciation of different people and their roles. And he said, when it came to King, and other ministers, he was like, they couldn't organize themselves out of a paper bag. They didn't know how to organize, but he was like, at that stage of the struggle, all you kind of needed to do was have a firm ass because you're just sitting down. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, he literally said that, but he was also King had, he was not an organizer, but he had obviously an extremely important role as a messenger and as a, as a leader in one sense. Um, But, you know, as, as so many people have said, Rustin was kind of the more, nuts and bolts organizer. And he had a, a great role in, you know, um, leading King to appreciate the labor movement more. He introduced King to the Packing House Workers of America, which wound up, you know, funding the Southern Christian Leadership Council, all this stuff. But it was, you know, those are the, all the movements have those people that make those connections behind the scenes and provide resources. We didn't even have room in our film to mention that it was Rustin's idea to start the Southern Christian Leadership Conference because King mm-hmm an organization that wasn't part of his church. And, you know, it, it that's like completely glossed over in our film, which I always feel bad about because it was a really important thing. But, you know, I'm sure you've talked about this in your previous shows about Rustin, but, you know, they needed these ministers partly to be very visible because they wanted to be sort of unimpeachable, which is why we haven't really talked about Rustin's sexuality. I guess that's not part of the revolution. I don't know. Um, <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding. Um, you know, that, that he couldn't be quite as visible because he was a gay man and that was going to be used against him. And of course, King's sexuality was used against him anyway by the FBI. Um, but I, I think there was a, certainly a perception by the mainstream, you know, the big eight of the civil rights movement that everyone had to be completely beyond reproach or nothing was going to get done. And it's a different era. I think that feels so antiquated now. Yeah, because I think I don't know how you guys feel about it. Would his homosexuality be t- way too front and center? You think, Paul, if it was to happen today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I could imagine a scenario where that, and you know, this is what's interesting about now reflecting about it, and this is why it was good. Your documentary didn't do this, but I feel like now. It's great he's being kind of appreciated more, but it's sort of like, I feel like if Rustin was alive, given his politics, he wouldn't want to be known for being gay. And I think that's kind of being put on the front end, all the, like the forgotten person because he was gay because of this. And I mean, he even has a quote where he says like, you know, my politics come from my Quaker upbringing and he might've said socialism, but you know, like not from being gay, obviously that's an important part of his life, you know, and that affected him. But I feel like that's kind of, if he was alive today, I think that would be the thing that people are kind of always pushing about the most important thing about him. Well, I think he lived in a very different era than we live in, you know, and he, it's hard for us to understand what it was like to be gay in the thirties and Mm forties. In other words, he might have changed his politics if he had lived into the 21st century. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just completely beyond conjecture. Um, and I, I think that being with Walter, his partner for the last 10 years of his life, did make him more, you know, connected to the gay rights movement. It wasn't really his thing, but mm-hmm. much more than he had ever been before. But yeah, I don't, I don't think, but I, I think that he would have said that, African-American civil rights were just just much more, much more critical political issue and, you know, economic rights and labor, you know, 
the advancement of labor. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to be in the position of speaking for him, but. But but I also think that it's it's really hard to map backwards, you know. I mean, he he had he couldn't be that open about his sexuality because it was just so dangerous. Although he pursued it vigorously, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but I see your point that that maybe we wouldn't be having this moment of appreciating him if he weren't such an intersectional figure. I I don't know. That's a. I think it's a hot thing right now. I think people are also we're probably looking for. Um, this is going to sound gross, but it's the reality of 2020. I think people were looking for figures to uh, to make movies about, especially after the success of Judas and the Black Messiah. And I think there's a, a narrative that people like to spin. We've made a million King movies and none of them have really hit that hard, right? Selma didn't do as good as people wanted it to do, but Judas did. So maybe a Rustin movie and we have this intersection intersectional story you can tell about a black man growing up in pre-civil rights america that is also gay and, and a very large uh, part of the civil rights movement and then you can focus a lot of your movie on him and his sexuality and how trying to contain that is this huge internal struggle um because you know maybe you can't fit that into your great man of history myth like you did with uh with judas and the black messiah which i think was kind of a huge failure of that movie it, it makes hampton the, the savior at 21. that well that brings i mean i have to ask before you need to go you know what what did you think of the the new netflix rustin movie if you've seen it it's kind of hard for me to talk about this uh, do they owe you money well, we were not consulted. You know, they certainly leaned heavily on our film. Um, I guess all I would say is that I think, you know, Coleman Domingo did a great job portraying Rustin. Um, and uh, again, I, I, it's just, I don't it's know. It's okay, Nancy. You're, you're, it's the circle of trust. Circle about, of trust. Yeah, I don't know who's listening. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they all are, more than you think. I, I think it made me proud of what we had done mm. that way. I'll say it. for one twelfth of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we didn't have amazing this. I thought the acting was really exceptional. They had great actors, um, but I, really, I don't, I don't really want harsh, you know. So. I'm sorry. I don't mind being harsh on the Netflix film. Yeah, when you when you leave, Nancy, we're going to be really harsh on that movie. So <laughs> no. Okay, I just don't want to be that person. Yeah. And I and I think it's important to say as a filmmaker that everyone has to create their own vision of the, you know, there are lots of books about Bayard Rustin now. There weren't that many when we started making our film, but a bunch have come out. They're all different. Some of them are better than others, but it's not for me to say, well, they should have done this or, you know, um, and I, I guess it just feels, um, it's like I play minor league baseball and they play for the, you know, Yankees, Yankees, whatever. Right. It's like, it's like for me to say anything about the Yankees, it's like, you know, I don't, I think there's a certain amount of, um, I think it's very unfortunate. And I think we are in a moment where documentarians have some respect, but I'm also friends with, you know, someone who made a, a documentary about the new Barbie, you know, that of course the Barbie film leaned heavily on her film. She didn't get any credit. She didn't get paid or anything like that. You know, my former teacher, John Ellis, made an amazing documentary the day after Trinity about Oppenheimer 25 or 30 years ago. I don't know what the date of that film is. I can talk about that. It's actually a much better film than Christopher Nolan's film, even though, you know, it doesn't have as many nuclear explosions or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's it's the truth. I mean, or a truth. Documentaries are always a truth. Um, so, it's it just, it doesn't seem to, it's not good for me to be talking about somebody else's work on the same subject. It's, you know, it just doesn't sound good, but I probably agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, what was most, I mean, I'll start by saying this, like I often, I get annoyed at leftists when they try to be hypercritical of every movie, especially high, Hollywood movies. It's like, why did you think to begin with, yeah. Like Fast and Furious 13 is not going to be a exactly. Marxist, but don't tell me that. Right. <laughs> but you know, I'm crushed. I'm crushed. this movie clearly they were 
trying to be semi-serious. And, you know, I'm willing to forgive a lot. Like, okay, you're going to focus on the March, not his whole life. But, I mean, from the Netflix movie, you don't get really a, any real window into his political philosophy. You don't get a window into why he believed the coalition with labor was so important. I mean, there's a line in there where they basically suggest, well, we need unions to pay for the latrines. That's like the only reason we just need someone to pay. Jesus. Literally, that's a line in there. I mean, that's really the only part they mentioned. He had why. spent decades, decades working with right. A. Philip Randolph. You don't even see the demands until the end. You might catch a sign. You know, you don't you don't see that there were labor demands. Um, so that part was just like even worse than I thought. And you would also think, I mean, this is all building up to the. Well, I don't want to give any spoilers, but it's okay. We know how it ends. Why not feature Bayard Rustin's speech from the March on Washington in the March on Washington scene, or or just make that all whole scene more of a thing? Um, yeah, it was it was trash. Because he's got to be the man that pulls the strings, right? Like that's there's a. There's a story that you're trying to convey right. in all he this. He was, but he also gave a speech. You would think you would feature the goddamn speech. They don't want to feature the speech because it's like you're you're the guy that pulls the strings in the background. Sit behind, yep, well, you sit say, behind your milk case, smoking a cigarette. But let me say it. something about speeches in our film too. So I actually wanted to make our film without MLK's speech because I felt like what we were trying to do was show Byron Rustin and what he contributed to this huge event. And so I was, I had these enormous fights with the editors about how we couldn't do this. And, you know, other people watched the work in progress and they said, you have to have King's speech. You have to have it. Your people don't feel complete without it. And I, I gave, I gave up on that fight in our, within our little team, but I thought it would have been so radical to show the March on Washington without Dr. King, you mm -hmm. know, because Everyone knows his speech, and what we were trying to show was everything that people didn't know. Um, but you know, but at least we have Rustin giving the demands, and we have him singing along with Mah Mahalia Jackson. That's my favorite clip. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, I teared up. Oh. I watched it this morning, and the Mahalia Jackson scene. Wait, before I go, I don't know what time it is, but I I do want to say that mm -hmm. another thing that was hard for me in making our film was that no women were allowed to speak at the March on Washington. They were allowed to sing, but they weren't allowed to mm. sing. And it, that was really hard for me. And I, I have a lesbian friend who, well, in the middle of us making this film, which took five and a half years, she said, why aren't you making a film about the women in, in the civil rights movement? And I said, look, that's a really important thing to do. I'm just doing this. Will you let me finish? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Quit talking, woman. No, I mean, it was almost like I was being disloyal to my sisters by making a film about a gay man, you know, but, um, but anyway. Patriarchy at it again. But, you know, but I think my point is that, that you do have opinions about things that happen in history when you're making a biography. You can't change them. You have to be honest, try to tell them in an honest way. Um, but it's not like everything that happened that he did that I agreed with. But, you know, that's not really what I was doing. So, but well, I just thought it was worth reminding people of that if they don't know. So, Nancy, you're you, right now, you're Siskel and Ebert, and someone's asking you to give your review of the Netflix Rustin movie. Do you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I'm just going to pass because I just don't want to answer these questions. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I want you all to say, and, 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 M I don't know how do I say this? M to say, you haven't said enough. Like, you know, I haven't. <laughs> right, you give I the critique. I mean, I, I mean, just. What happens, Nancy, is we have a quota for how much we let women speak on the show. Yeah, I, I get you've it. You've gone over it. You've gone yes. over it. Oh, so she get, doesn't get any airtime. She doesn't get any. No, it's my fault. No. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and and you said you're a lesbian. So that's... What about stepping back? I'm sorry. Taking oh. one for the team. You know, oh, I'm from Boston, goodness. so I can really lay it down. If you, you know, if you start being a little snarky with me, I'm just gonna lose it. So I just, I'm just warning both of you, or all three of you. Um, I think that M. Toussaint gets a pass because she needs more airtime. But you two, I, if you know, I wasn't gonna be snarky. I'm very sincere. But if you want to be snarky, watch out. You're from the Bay Area. You, you won't be able to handle it, Jason. That is you all Beatles. can represent because of Philly. Are you from some tough part of Philly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. 
<laughs> the toughest. The place okay. where Omar Johnson resides. I'm so uh, sorry. I've lost Jason. I've reduced him to tears. Oh my god. <laughs> I, just took, I just took the earplugs. I didn't want to hear the rest. Some of my best work here, you know. But seriously, I I just feel like I shouldn't be talking about this in public. So when I go to the Bay Area, when I go to the Bay Area, can we go to where do we where can we go? Do you so if you live by Solano, which is like my favorite street in all I went to Albany High. Uh-huh. So I swim in their pool all the time. I love it. <laughs> just illegally, you just kick the door in. Right. No, no, no. You buy a pass. They pay for the pass. It's legal. Don't worry. But you have to pay more. You just... If you don't live at Albany, you pay more than the Albanians, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry, you really, I'm losing it now. Not, not real Albanians, but <laughs> Albanians, like people from Albany, Paul. I don't want you to think that she's racist against Oh. You guys, they're from the East Coast with like Albanians walking around. They're I'm talking about Albania right in Europe. I was there talking about those Albanians. Albanians. <laughs> Why would that be racist? Paul's like, my mother's an Albanian. <laughs> I mean, the residents of Albany pay less for their swim passes. We're really getting off subject here. That is so <laughs> I'm talking about Byron Easy Rustin laugh, Rustin. Jason. I just want to say I really appreciate it. Um, do we want to talk? But I was trying to get M. Toussaint to talk about the film. Did you see the Rustin feature film? I did see the film. I saw, I saw it as soon as it came out. I was so excited. Um, right up my alley. Just the sort of thing that I, I like to know about. I'm by no means, Paul. I'm not, I'm not the Rustin head that's going to put on the you know, gonna gonna let the filmmaker know things they didn't know. I I am not that person, but I'm very interested in, you know, the civil rights era and and organizing that sort of thing. Because organizing is kind of mysterious. Mm. And I mean, okay. <laughs> oh no, she, she talking about your answer. movie. She saw your movie. She hasn't seen the Netflix movie. Oh, okay. I was trying to get I her to talk. I was movie. trying to no, get her to do what you asked me to do. I no, mean, she hasn't seen it. Oh, I'm like, sorry. My feeling is. <laughs> I just don't want to say it. Here's another thing, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the love affair with the NAACP person they portray is fictional. Yes. That's it, their prerogative, I think. It's just weird. That's another weird thing. Like, why do that? <laughs> but I actually don't think they did such a good job portraying her relationship with Tom Kahn, which right. has been very well documented because of all the FBI tapes. Right. Which I think know. is the more interesting one to portray. Thumbs down. Two thumbs down. Six thumbs down. They just made him just a fake person. But, but I actually thought it was kind of great to have to show him having an affair with an African American young man who was supposedly straight or married because that certainly happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even though it was fiction, I, I don't know. I just I, honestly, I feel like you have to let a thousand flowers bloom, and it's just not appropriate for me to talk about somebody else's work on the same subject. But I understand why you want me to. <laughs> Look, Nancy, their garden is fine, man. F those people. They're, they're good. Man. They're good. There, was, there was little details like Transit Workers Union Local 100, a very important union in labor history, New York City Transit. And they say Local 101. And it's like, you can't even get that goddamn detail right. It was Local 100. <laughs> um, I know it doesn't really matter, but it's like, what, what is wrong with it? What I thought, one thing I thought was funny was that Eleanor Holmes Norton was allowed to fly because she had to stay in the office and they had her there when she wasn't there, you know, which is like a historical fact. It's a very, another small detail, but I thought, why, like, is there some reason to change that? Like, I, you know, I've experimented in writing screenplays and they're hard. And I think my way of looking at it is you keep all the facts to the degree that the story works and you only change tiny things if they don't work. Mm -hmm. um, but that one, there was no reason to not have her, you know, to change that historical thing because it's, you know, but um, can we talk about something else? <laughs> <laughs> I just, do you see the private chat on your screen, Nancy? Um, I don't know. Maybe it's below. Yeah. It's on the bottom. Do you see it? It says private chat. I just sent you a message. I, I don't like, is it this little icon? Probably. Um, no, I see the other people. Dan oh my God, Albanians. 
<laughs> oh, okay, you're in the wrong space. But I grew, up, I grew up in <laughs> South. No, I did not grow up in Southie. Okay, I can't see any of that. It's oh, good. No. <laughs> so I don't know what you were saying. I can't. I don't know. I'm technologically idiotic. You know. It's okay. We've seen old I'm people. Gonna use keep it everything above board. No private chat. Huh? Is it? Is it these three little dots? No. What does it look like on your guys' screen? Because I'm on my run the show screen, so it it's looks different. Towards the left. I see the chat chat, but not the private chat. Chat yes. chat is on the right. This yeah, is stay away from that. Go to the left. Go yeah. into the light, Carol Ann. My, I don't think my, I think my screen is just not the same as your screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nancy's screen is racist. I think we've just discovered. <laughs> <laughs> it's really the same as Paul. Not, well, first of all, I'm hiding the chat, which is good because I'm trying to concentrate on the on you folks, Very good. right? Yeah, don't. I have one more question at least. Uh oh, I don't know why got one any, minute. Any questions? I just I get a little sensitive about you know my screen, but you know. <laughs> what uh, I mean, what do you make kind of of Barack Obama, kind of trying to I guess align himself with Rustin's legacy, and not just with this film. I mean, I was. I get to tell a story. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I apologize. No, no. I mean, we got time. invited to the White House to see him get his posthumous Medal of Freedom. Oh, and wow. so I got I got to meet the Obamas. And one of my friends had gone a few years before. You know, the Medal of Freedom is one of these few days that the president and their family get to sort of show their own, you know, their own values. And, you know, amazing people like Loretta Lynn were getting these awards. And um, one of my friends had gone and he said that, um, you know, Michelle hugs everyone. And that my, this other friend who's a filmmaker, you know, that that. He, she hugged him and he said, okay, I'm good. I can die now. You know, I'm, I'm good. And so I told her that when she hugged me, you know, <laughs> and then when I met the president, I said, I said, you know, hi, I'm Nancy Cates. I made the film about, By about Byron Rustin. And I said, I was hoping in your speech, you would say that you stood on his shoulders and, you know, he doesn't miss a beat. He said, well, I didn't write my speech. You know, I would have been happy to, but I tried, you know, <laughs> So I, yeah. I think he actually did feel like he stood on Russ's shoulders. Um, but and one of my friends, I told the story to them and they're like, you said that to the president of the United States? I said, yeah, he's a human being. <laughs> wow. I mean, even if he's like gorgeous and six foot tall or whatever he is. I mean, Michelle, it was like being hugged by this, you know, beautiful giraffe. Like I'm five three. You know? <laughs> but, but, you know, I could die happy too now. It is interesting because, and even you know, there's a great collection of Russian essays called "Time on Two Crosses," and Obama Two crosses. writes the forward. And again, I mean, I feel a little. It's like clearly Obama didn't support anything like the freedom budget. I, you know, I'm kind of like, what exactly is the legacy that you feel you align with Russian here? You know, but um, I think it's actually wonderful that he is lifting up the the legacy of someone who had been ignored, from, you know, historically, and who exemplifies something that yeah he may not have agreed with the details of some of the more lefty parts of Rustin's you know political vision but I he obviously chose to give him the medal chose to you know be the producer of this film because he he does care about his legacy so I'm going to defend Barack for a moment because you know nobody's perfect but um uh thank you Nancy <laughs> uh I appreciate it Wait, is that not something that's okay? <laughs> no, that's Barack Obama's <laughs> thing. Thank you. Did I say something wrong? Uh, no, no, you did not. <laughs> that was Jason bad Obama. Well, maybe, maybe he's Barack a better Obama. maybe he's a better president than producer. I don't know. I don't know. Before he's Obama. making a lot of money. Yeah, he's I, making a lot of money. Look, Nancy, it's I don't want to keep you and get in trouble. Well, I, I can answer one more question because I feel like that wasn't a good place to end. If if that's okay, I'm not trying to take the reins here. No, no, no. We we I'm gonna are, find we, out what M2 looks like. Oh no, that's not. <laughs> you find out before I do. I'm gonna be. Yeah, that's not gonna happen. She's so kidding. secretive about kidding. her identity. Just kidding. Just kidding. She is so secretive about her identity. Like I couldn't believe that she showed up to the live thing with the mask on. I did. She did, and then she hid in the back the whole time. I respect, I respect it. But, it's a metal but, gladiator mask. Are there things about Russell that we haven't talked about that you want to? Uh, I mean, I well, I want to go ahead. Uh oh, nope, Tucson, ladies Tucson. first. Ooh, ladies uh, first. 
his organizing prowess how how was it how was he able to be such a good organizer we have social media now and that's not enough so he how is he able five cards, index cards yeah he well, had he index was very cards. charismatic but he also understood i think he was a strategic thinker and i don't mm -hmm. think everyone who's leading movements today maybe has that ability of course there, we don't have these charismatic charismatic leaders in the same way but um you know i um I think he saw structurally, right? So he said, we need to train police officers to do nonviolent crowd control and we need, you know, toilets. Like he, he could see these big pictures that inclu include all the things, the buses, you know, th there were just so many parts of this. And, and also I think hopefully if you do anything for decades, you get good at it. <laughs> you know? right, right. I mean, he was able to organize tiny protests with five people and he was able to organize this huge one with 250,000 people. You know, he'd gotten really good at it over 25 years. Um, I don't know if he had organized a march during World War II, which he and A. Philip Randolph tried to do. And, you know, the threat of that march allowed, you know, yeah. pushed Roosevelt to, you know, desegregate the munitions industry. But, you know, I don't know if it would have been quite as successful as the 1963 March if they had done it in the 40s because he had all that time to, um, but I don't even know if I'm answering your question. No, you um, are. No, that that you are because that's kind of really important. You know, what would have happened had that March happened? Do we not get the civil rights bill? Right. So, and, you know, I think the people around him were afraid it was, you know, became less and less of a protest and, and more, something else but it still had you know it sent an enormous message to the country and um i don't know i'm so sorry that i have to leave but this has been super interesting and fun and you all you are rusted heads it's very impressive um so thank you for having me and it was nice to meet you all and um you know take care <laughs> thank you very much nancy nancy filmmaker nancy cates thank please you. check out brother outsider it is a documentary that I found it on something called Quayley TV. It's no longer on uh, Amazon. That was, you know, what? that's what I forgot to ask her. Did it get pulled with the Netflix thing? Right. I forgot to ask that. Dang it. I found it on Vimeo or Vimeo or whatever. Oh, you found it on Vimeo? Yeah, you had to pay. Yeah. I paid like $2 to rent it. Oh, I got to pay. I had to pay three ninety nine. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I owe I owe you and Tucson money. Indeed. I owe you and Tucson money. I'm sorry. But but yeah, definitely people in the audience watch that instead of the Netflix one. It, I think it was it was a very well well done documentary. It's worth it. It's really it, I dude, I was in tears. It makes me it makes me want to watch Eyes on the Prize now. Yeah, and you know the clips of the debates are great. With I mean, there's a there's a clip anyone can find on YouTube on Rustin versus Malcolm X. But um, yeah. once with him and Kwame Ture, really interesting to see. I, I want to find the full video of that debate. I I should ask Nancy where to get that. But. I think Rustin versus Malcolm X is a really important debate for people to watch. Yeah. That kind of have an idea of who they think Malcolm X is because of the Spike Lee movie and like quotes right. he pulled from the internet. But, you know, you really watch that and then watch like a, a Metzger video from the 80s and tell me there's much of a difference. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, Rustin clearly wins. Um, but yeah, anyone can go on YouTube and find a, at least an audio of that debate. Um, Somebody, uh, Thomas Hooker has a great comment right here. This is a great comment. That's payback for that documentary Kyrie Irving recommended about how Hitler loved black people or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Kyrie and Nancy are making one on Umar Johnson. So, uh, are you effing with me? Oh, you said Nancy. I was yeah. thinking Nancy Reagan for some. <laughs> that would also be amazing. There's so many different people. <laughs> Somebody said, "Was Pog Chaser MLK in the Rustin movie?" I mean, yeah. if you have an active imagination, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Technically, yes. 
He's always with us. He's in all of us at some point. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's campaign room talk. Let me. Uh, oh my go. God! He said he's in all of us. <laughs> Inside of everyone, there's a pog chasing civil rights champion. Yes, yeah, someone says it's, it's, not, it's not available anywhere in the states. It's not available in Mexico. I think it got pulled. Um, and I, I didn't realize it was so old. I, I for some reason I thought it was like 2017 it came out, but mm -hmm. right, I, no. that was like shocking to me. Yeah, I mean, look at who they're talking to. Some of those people still look relatively young. Right, Andrew Young looks relatively young. Um. He's inside them. <laughs> I'm so glad that Nancy didn't ask what a pog was. <laughs> oh, man. I would have just logged off. <laughs> <laughs> and and mind you, this was a PR company hit us up. We're getting hit up by PR companies. That's 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 the kind of show that TIR is at this point. We made it. We've made it. Yep. Multiple apparently, all these PR companies have never watched the show. They Not at all. No idea what. Not at no. all. You know why? You know why? Because our show is rated. That's why as a podcast. We're. I don't know how that works, but our show comes up in certain ratings. So they're like, "Oh, this is a show." They look like here. Talk to these people. They have a pulse. They have a pulse. Yeah. yeah they'll show up. They'll show <laughs> Five minutes late. For 10 minutes late, but yeah. I, dude, some Imagine. of the, interview, the interviews we've been able to get because of this, I think they've been great. We had Charles Derber, Tom Warman, you know, famous producer, the guy that discovered Kiss, Nancy, Kate. I, I never would have been able to find her email. So that that's this is pretty cool. I'm really happy about it. So look, we're going to the champagne room. Paul, I'm assuming you're going to sleep. I actually can join you this time. Oh shit. Really? Yeah. I this have. is why people need to be patrons. Every once in a while, I will join the champagne room. It's happening. The, look, Toussaint, look. I got the elbow patches. <laughs> the guest. Very nice. All joining us for the champagne room. It's all happening. It's, it's all happening. And my son is calling. So on that note, thank you guys so much. We'll meet you in the champagne room, Paul. I'll send you that link. All right. And we are out.